Welcome Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. It's an absolute delight to speak to you about your new book, Notes on a Nervous Planet. For those at home who perhaps haven't heard anything about your book before, I was wondering if you could please give us a brief introduction on what features in the book. Um, yeah, I suppose the idea is placing mental health in the context of society and how we live and how that affects our minds. We're very used to doing this with our bodies and our physical health, you know, how lifestyle impacts that. So I wanted to sort of place mental health in that similar context and look at the fast changing technological world we're in and what impact that's having on our mental health. You talk a lot about the love-hate relationship we all have with the internet. What is your experience and how can we all stay sane whilst living our lives online? Yeah, well, my experience is, my personal experience is I'm not very good at it myself. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, was to sort of like research why it was having an effect on me, why I was getting more addicted to things. You know, Twitter was my, my total Achilles heel. I'd spent, waste whole weekends arguing with people with a flag avatar in Texas who I'd never meet. And um, they'd be ruining my weekend and we'd be both having an argument which neither of us was going to win and it just seemed pointless. And I was staying up late, um, not just on the internet, but on, um, you know, watching Netflix or whatever it was. So I, I, I think it's just being aware of this stuff. I mean, that's the main thing. I don't have any sort of foolproof advice. I've got little things I do. For instance, I no longer charge my phone by my bed. I charge it downstairs. So at least I have to get up and start the day and eat something before I check my emails and news and everything else and it's just just being aware you know that we have this continual feeling that everything is getting worse but that feeling isn't necessarily reality and that was a big lesson for me from mental illness because me mental illness gives you lots of feelings that aren't reality and, and I feel like we're heading into the kind of world where we've all got a sort of collective disorder where we've got this feeling that everything's getting worse and there's a parallel with the sort of world of the internet and the world of the mind because we're all sort of little neurons in the planetary mind, as it were. On the subject of Twitter, you're an active Twitter user and have written quite freely about how it can affect your own levels of happiness. In your opinion, is our addiction to sharing our voices online and creating this kind of new identity detrimental? And should we be trying to switch off to notifications constantly? Or is there positivity to be found in social media? There is absolutely positivity to be found on social media, as with the internet. I think it's one of the most wonderful things. But it's also, there's a scary aspect to it. Um, the former head of Google, Eric Schmidt, said that the internet is the first invention of humanity that human beings don't Fully understands you know we, we we've created this thing but it's sort of beyond our control so I think we just have to be careful with it. it it's I always compare it to ice cream which might be a bit of a silly comparison but uh, you wouldn't want to stop eating ice cream but you would understand that eating ice cream for six hours in bed on a Saturday morning wouldn't be necessarily good for your health, even if it was pleasurable at the time. So I think we've just got to be aware of how we use it. And also this feeling we have of having to, we feel like we have to be up, date, up to date with everything, with our friendships, almost on an hourly basis, with the news every half hour, every tweet from Donald Trump, whatever it is, we've got this urgency to be up to speed with everything and, and almost like it's a civic duty to um, read the news like a hundred times a day. I mean I, I've got someone who, um, a friend on Facebook actually, who pointed out and she remembers the 70s vividly and she says in the 70s you had your news twice a day. It's an American woman. You got your news twice a day, once in the morning, um, the newspaper, and then you had the six o'clock roundup, and they still got rid of Nixon. You know, social change still happened, progress happened. You, we don't need to be having this drip feed of doom all day long. You mentioned the news. Should newspapers and news online websites take more responsibility for creating what can be at times a mass level of panic and the content of which they choose to report? Yeah, I think it's very difficult at this point because, because of where we are with mental health. But I think in the future, and hopefully what will happen, as more people are aware of A, mental health, and B, at the, the impact that um, these sort of news sites and social media sites have on our mental well-being, it will get to a point where it's almost like tobacco companies and fast food companies, where they still exist, 
but they're moderated and regulated and health consequences are understood. We're getting there on the political side with things like the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, privacy scandals, data breaches and all of that, all of that stuff. And I think the next level will almost be like a psychological revolution where people understand it as a health issue. We've all been in the situation where we've been saying, I seem to have no time at the moment. What can we do to live in the now and appreciate the things we have rather than the things that we do not? Yeah, I, I think when people look for a, like a life solution or a way to suddenly feel calmer or happier, they're often expecting someone to add something in or something to be added into the mix, whether it's exercise or yoga class or any of those things, which is all perfectly fine. But often in an overloaded culture, overloaded society, the solution is taking things away, stripping back finding the acoustic song version of yourself. And I, I think we, that's generally the problem with our consumer culture, with our online culture. We've just, we've got an infinity of choice and we've got a very finite lifespan as we always did have. And so we can't replicate ourselves. So we just have to accept that we're not going to do everything, we're not going to go to every party, we're not going to achieve everything, we're not going to live every one of our lifetimes. And we've just got to be getting back to that sort of human thing about being happy um, with that, with our one life and realising that everything we have is already here. We've always been encouraged to want the best in life, to always try and beat our past successes. What is the link of desire to happiness and what can we do to be kinder to ourselves and live in a I'm never good enough mindset? Well, of course, the etymology of the word want is a lack and like it's fine to want something, whatever it is, whether it's internet popularity, fame, perfect body, whatever. But when we're wanting, it, it's a lack. And that's what sort of drives the consumer economy now because we've, most of us in the developed world have got the sort of basic material things we need. We've got running water, we've got shelter, we've got food. Um, but the, 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 for the economy to keep driving forward, we've got to have new wants. And uh, so we're encouraged to be anxious a lot of the time. There's even an a acronym that marketing gurus use called FUD, F-U-D, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So it's something to instill in a brand. So for instance, if you're selling an anti-aging moisturizer, you've also got to sell the message that you should be worried about looking old. So, you know, whether it's selling insurance or a politician selling their policies, we're encouraged to fear things because it, it's not really, sex that sells, it's fear that sells, and we're in this world where we're encouraged to be um, anxious. And I think that's one of the reasons why I used to get panic attacks primarily in supermarkets and shopping centres and those sort of places, because you're bombarded with um, artificial messages and it's an overload in your brain, which is what panic becomes. What impact has being in nature had for you? And should we be trying to get outdoors and spend more time in nature? Well, I'm a great believer in, um, you know, trying to get back to our sort of natural selves. And I wax lyrical about the sky and the sea and all those things in a sort of sixth form poet way. But it's definitely something that helped me in my depression. There's actually research now to back it up. Um, recently, I think it was the University of Exeter. They um, took a sample of, um, quite a small sample, under 100 people, but they, they did the exact same length walk in a forest and compared it with the same people doing the same 45 minute walk in a shopping center and um, measured their sort of uh, mental health findings. And um, the walk in the forest, everyone felt healthier afterwards, everyone ha had better posture, their self-esteem improved. And it was the exact opposite with the walk in the shopping center. So we say walking's good for you, but you know, walking in a shopping center isn't so good for us, certainly not good for our mental health. Um, and again, I think it's because we're, we, 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 we're bombarded with all that stuff. So yes, I think so. I think a lot of our problems really are that disconnect from nature, because we are still fundamentally natural. Um, our bodies haven't really changed in 30,000 years. We haven't evolved. Um, yet our world has changed beyond all measure. So it's like we're um, 30,000 year old Neolithic hardware trying to run the software of the 21st century society and it's no wonder that we crash. So the more we can sort of um, feel connected 
to our sort of circadian rhythms, waking up in daylight, going to sleep in the dark, um, eating at the right time, um, being as natural as we can, um, then I think there is a sort of mental health payoff with that as well. There is a chapter about fiction being freedom. How have books helped you through nervous times and how important is the act of reading? Oh, very important. I mean, for me personally, autobiographically, when I was 24 and I had my breakdown, I was back living with my parents in Newark-on-Trent. Um, it wasn't even a bookshop in Newark-on-Trent at that time, um, but I had all the books on my shelf from being a child, so it was children's stories. And so in the midst of depression, um, when I was unable to look at a computer screen, look at the TV without being overstimulated, even magazines would sometimes sort of fill my mind with unwanted images. Just reading these children's books was such a, you know, whether it's Winnie the Pooh, um, a book called The Outsiders by Essie Hinton, whatever it was, I was reading it and it was a story I knew very well and there was a comfort in it. And I think the other reason fiction is a comfort, as well as it, being a sort of safe space that's not your own mind, is the fact that stories are about change. So when you're stuck in a moment, um, the, that actual simple act of a character changing or a situation changing becomes a kind of therapy in itself, I think. This series is called Books in the Life Of. So what books have had a lifelong effect on you? Um, well, that one I just mentioned, The Outsiders, was definitely up there. Um, it's often the books you read at quite a young age and then return to. So things like Bonjour Tristesse by Francois Sagan, um, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, Jeanette Winterson, um, a lot of Graham Greene, who I studied at university. I was literally the only person at Leeds University who did the Graham Greene module. And um, so I, ha I, I, I read almost every Graham Greene um, Book. And I still didn't get my distinction um, in my Graham Greene dissertation, which I, I, I processed. It's okay, I've moved on. Um, and what else? What else? Oh, nonfiction, Cosmos by Carl Sagan, um, what, which it, Carl Sagan was almost like the Brian Cox of the 1980s, who was a sort of pop scientist um, American who. Um, wax lyrical about the universe and the possibility of alien life and yes it was um, it's almost like opening that book it's like looking up at the sky and it places you in as a small speck in the universe and it takes you out of yourself in a very nice way. One of my favourite parts in the book is the chapter called Imagine. To give our viewers a snippet taste of the book, I was yes. wondering if you'd be so kind as to read us a short passage. To I can do that yes okay here we go. Um, Yes, this is a chapter called Imagine. It's typically very short, here we go. Imagine if we had a day where we called human beings, human beings. Not nationalities first, not the religion they follow, not British, not American, not French, not German, not Iranian, not Chinese, not Muslim, not Sikh, not Christian, not Asian, not black, not white, not man, not woman, not CEO of Coca-Cola, not gang member, not mother of three, not historian, not economist, not BBC journalist, not Twitter user, not consumer, not Star Trek fan, not author, not age 17 or 39 or 83, not conservative, not liberal. Change it all to human, the way we see all turtles as turtles. Human, human, human. Make ourselves see what we pretend to know. Remind ourselves that we are an animal united as a species existing on this tender blue speck in space, the only planet that we know of containing life. Bathe in the corny sentimental miracle of that. Define ourselves by the freakish luck of not only being alive but being aware of that, that we are here right now on the most beautiful planet we'll ever know. A planet where we can breathe and live and fall in love and eat peanut butter on toast and say hello to dogs and dance to music and read Bonjour Tristesse and binge watch TV dramas and notice the sunlight accentuated by hard shadow on a building and feel the wind and the rain on our tender skin and look after each other and lose ourselves in daydreams and night dreams and dissolve into the sweet mystery of ourselves. A day where we are essentially precisely as human as each other. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. It's so rare to find yourself reading a book where you're reading it and you're nodding along because everything makes sense and you want to tell everyone about it and read passages out loud. It's 
open, it's humorous, it's thoughtful, it's understanding, it's welcoming to all the different types of factors that make us worry in life and stating, you know what, it's okay to worry and it's good to know about what makes us worry and to know about these things. I would highly recommend for everyone to read your book. Thank you so much. It's been lovely oh, to speak you, to you Hannah. today. Um, and if anyone would like to purchase it, it's available on blackcars.co.uk or within one of our bookshops. But thank you again, thank Matt. It's been a delight. Very much.